Neil and his co-founder bootstrapped the Starter League to over $1 million in his first year, but listen to how they almost ran out of money in the very beginning. Neil also talks about his three rules that he lives by in business and hear what type of person is most likely to succeed in the Starter League, and it's not what you think. He even talks about what one person did to pay for the tuition for the Starter League, that and much more. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Neil Salas Griffin, is the co-founder of the Starter League, where they teach people to code, design, and ship web apps. Starter League has taught nearly 700 students in the past two years. And Neil, a fun fact about Neil, he was a junior Olympian for track and field and was also in the chess club in high school. So he's your all-around renaissance man. Neil, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. So, Neil, oftentimes we learn our most valuable lessons from mistakes we made going through the journey. So I'm excited to hear your top advice for business owners and big lessons you learn from the mistakes or you know roadblocks you hit along your journey. Can you tell us, um, I want to talk a little about some of the mistakes. Um, was there a hiring mistake that you had made or that you learned from? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've, we've hired over 20 different people between employees and contractors, and we've had a lot of people on our team. And one of the most salient moments I can think of is when we were initially working on a product. So we had a software product that we built um, to manage our school, our classrooms, and those activities, and I initially like overstaffed the team. So I thought that you know we were going to need all these different skill sets, and that you know I had these great people that I knew. So I brought them all in, and it was it ended up being four of us uh, working all on you know the initial build out of this prototype. And one of the most challenging things that I learned was that you know even though everyone is highly skilled, that doesn't mean that everyone can functionally work together especially on V1 of a product, it's too early of a stage to have so many cooks in the kitchen. So one of the, one of the really difficult things I went through there was having to make the call of adjusting the team, resetting expectations for why I hired these people, and then you know, eventually letting you know, a few people go in order for us to focus and, and whittle down to a two-person team to actually get the product done. But we ended up being more productive in a team of two than in a team of four and that was much to my surprise. Yeah, that's why I asked, because you're a smart guy. What made you decide to, early on, um, most of us probably would have thought the same thing. What made you decide to hire more people? Well, I, I originally, I brought on two people, and I thought that between the developer, the designer, and then me as a product manager kind of skill set, we would function well. Then I met another person that I was very impressed by and that had a dual skill set in both back end and front end and I felt like he and I could work really well together so eventually what happened was I got this extra guy involved and then the other two I had were like what the hell like (laughs) this is an extra person and you know that kind of thing so the there was like this personality clash for a second and then on top of that there was just a you know like a lack of uh there was like philosophical difference in terms of approach right. to building a product. So with all that happening, um, it was hard to predict what would happen, but I ended up having to you know, rework the team a bit. So how do you do that? I mean, you say that kind of nonchalantly, but it's not, it's easier said, like you have another person there and you have to like say, hey, like we only need this number of people. So how do you yeah. navigate that? Yeah, we had some advice. I got a lot of advice from my advisors. I would talk to people about it and I ended up just sitting down with them and, you know, that's where, you know, the role shift. Because in that team, I was an equal. You know, we were all just kind of working together. But then I had to like put on the CEO hat again, and then sit down and say, "Look, we're we've got to do something different." I know these are the expectations we set before about how this is going to work, and it's changing. And I'm sorry, but you know, we we can't have this the way it is now. So I it took it took a long time because we there were a lot of email back and forth. There were a lot of sit down meetings and a lot of time honestly wasted uh, because of this. So it was a difficult decision and it it was high cost to us, but we've we've made up for it. Got it. Yeah, that's that's important. How did the person take it? Yeah, I mean, it's in in stride, you know, like it's, it's, 
Because the reaction is tough too. Like if the person's understanding, it makes it e- a little easier on you. But if not, it, it's probably a difficult situation. Yeah, it was a little rocky. It was a little rocky, yeah. but you know, you got over it, and people get over it. And in in the moment, it's always overly emotional. But then over time, it kind of you realize how minuscule that situation really was. Yeah. And I know like, you know, early on too, when you're figuring out kind of what exactly the business is going, what course it's going to take, did you have any um, roadblocks or mistakes you made with kind of the positioning of it or what you did with it? Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges we've had with running a school is that, you know, people come in with different expectations. So when you're trying to learn or, you know, you're signing up for a school, not everybody's coming for the exact same reason but we try to target as much as we can. So what we want people to do at our school is harness their intrinsic motivation to learn a new skill set, to wield software and technology to solve meaningful problems that they've identified that they care about. Mm -hmm. We have people that come in because the problem that they want to solve is that they want to get a job. We have people that come in that have an idea for an app that they want to build. We have people that come in that aren't sure and they just want to learn a new skill set and in time they feel like they'll be able to apply it to something uh, me and with those different priorities and interests it becomes very difficult to manage expectations of what the outcomes will be mm-hmm. what you put in is what you get out in any educational environment and unfortunately and fortunately for us we don't kick people out of our program you know so so long as you're participating coming to class and doing your work it's all good But we can't really control or manage what you do in your spare time, what you do on your nights, your weekends, and how you apply what you're learning. Right. There's there's a there's a gap there. And I think we filled it finally because we've set reset our expectations with you know our interview process, what we communicate to potential students for our different types of classes. So our nighttime classes is less of a commitment than our daytime class. We have a new program called Starter School that's gonna require a much more immersive and intense uh, commitment from a lot of people. So we have a good range of offerings now that cater to each of those groups that I mentioned. So what was the target early on? And how did it kind of transform? Well, we didn't exactly know what the market looked like. We just knew who we were and we knew what we wanted. So me and my co-founder, Mike McGee, we were like, you know what? There's gotta be people out there like us. And the people I'm talking about are what I just described, people that see the world in a way where they see opportunity to make it better through technology. And, and they're willing to uh, do whatever it takes and knock down whatever walls, climb whatever mountains to get there. That's really it. So basically, you have more of a stringent kind of process for people to get in because you, you're not going to like kick anyone out afterwards? Exactly, yeah. So the, the interview process is very stringent, it's very targeted, and there's already a filter that happens in filling out the application on our website. So who do you want to attract then? Uh, Like, do you see a difference between then and now with the people you've attracted? We've learned a lot about the types of students that have the best uh, chance to succeed by going through our program, and those are usually the crazy ones. So the people that are insanely committed They will sacrifice whatever is necessary in order to get to Chicago, to go through the program, to pay for it, and they have a relentless work ethic throughout the program, and they're extremely committed to practicing, studying, and applying all the time. And we have gotten a good feel for what that looks like, even at the the beginning of that whole process. So what's something crazy that someone would tell me? Uh, a guy that sold his house. Really? To pay, yeah, to pay for the program. Wow. He sold his house and moved to Chicago just to you know, cover the cost of living here and go, going through our program. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's intense. It is. What's um, early on? I know you've always been uh, a business owner, entrepreneur. Was there something early, from your early days before uh, the Starter League? that's influenced you? Yeah, uh, one of the biggest moments for me was when I was starting out in college and when I got there, you know, my background and upbringing, you know, in Chicago isn't one of privilege, you know, I didn't have a lot of money, didn't come up in a, you know, family that had a lot of resources, 
So we struggled a lot. So when I got to college, I thought, all right, I'm in college. I need to get a job that's going to pay me a lot of money. Um, and I thought that that would be the key to happiness and success for me. And as, I think, as a lot of people think. Yeah, a lot of yeah. people think that. And, and you know, it's a fair thought. But I realized that I believed in something more. And I just needed to uncover it <laughs> for myself. But I, I couldn't be further, that couldn't be more wrong, at least for me. Because more than making a lot of money, it was about finding work that I enjoyed mm -hmm. and that I found meaningful. And in doing so, I would find ways to have the resources that I'd need to have the lifestyle and live the kind of life that I'd want to live. And in pursuing that meaningful work, then I would find a way to make that meaningful work sustainable. You know, So it's not about the money. It's about the impact. And in making that impact, you should find ways to you know, support yourself as you continue doing the work that you do. Right. What about, um, I know that you also um, had some stint with barbershops. Can you tell yeah. us your experience with that? Yeah, so ironically enough, I decided to uh, start a barbershop back in college. And I wrote a business plan for it, went around, talked to lots of different barbershops and people, and ended up meeting a guy who had one barbershop and was interested in opening up more and was also interested in my plans to, to run it. So he let me kind of operate the business. So I kind of took his barbershop over to run my own and we opened up a second one and it was it was what it was great. I learned so much. It was it was an amazing experience of just being in charge of a business. But at the same time I didn't I rushed into it. I didn't know what I was signing up for completely and all the agreements weren't, you know, always set in stone. It was very unclear what the terms were going to be for how our partnership would work. I just kind of got excited about running a business and just took it over and ran with it. And one of the biggest challenges was a, a value difference between me and the person I partnered with. His interest was in you know, building very quickly. He wanted to open up a lot of business, a lot of shops all over the place and build fast, whereas I was more interested in building a prototype and focusing on that one prototype and making it great and then considering whether we want to replicate or not. Mm -hmm. What's funny about that contrast between franchising is that lesson has actually carried over into my current business. So a lot of people early on asked if we wanted to scale the starter league or franchise the starter league or take the starter league to other cities and places right. and I utterly reject the notion for now and the reason being is the question I ask is, would you scale Harvard? You know, do you want Harvard to be at your doorstep? Do you want it to be like McDonald's in every city, in every country, in every town? Or is it this amazing experience of one of the best institutions on the planet that you relocate to to go through something special? Because the quality of the education isn't something that can be spread thin throughout every, you know, ge geographic location. So that's, that's really what I say about that lesson and what I learned and how I applied it. I like it. So Harvard for web apps, the new tagline for startup. Best place. We're not ubiquitous place. We're yeah. the best place. I love it. What's um, you know, what's a big milestone? I mean, we talk about some of the lessons, some of the mistakes. What's a big milestone you're especially proud of that you've uh, been able to accomplish with the Starter League? Yeah, so me and my, my co-founder, we, we look at each other and we're like, wow, we've been doing this for two years. And being in business for two years is not... It, it, it's fun. It's easy to just think about it like, oh yeah, it's, you know, two years now. Let's what's the next five? But we're live for two years. That is incredible. I remember when we initially thought about what we were going to do. The idea was to teach twelve students. We we're like, can we find twelve people that we could teach just for three months? And we all hope it works out. Maybe those twelve turned into thirty-five. Thirty-five turned into fifty-six. Fifty-six turned into eighty-eight. Ninety-three. Uh, 102, 122, 159, and now over 700 people have learned from us. So it's gotten pretty amazing in short in a short time period. Yeah. So what's one of those people that you think on that you're like, wow, we, you know, this person went through the program? Yeah. There's there's a, one of our students. His name is Greg Williams. He uh, went through. He came over from China. He's not Chinese, but he lived in China, and he came from China to Chicago just to go through one of our night classes wow. and he treated it like a full time for them and he was, he was 
insane. It was, it was so amazing to see this guy's work ethic. But then he actually took a design class and he got really interested in development. So he took another class with us afterwards, um, learning back end. So he knew front end and back end and then he wanted more. So he ended up taking a few more of our advanced design classes. And then he became a TA for us. But on top of that, all along the side, he started his own business, uh, his own web development firm. He co-founded a startup and he's been doing uh, consulting work on the side. Uh, and he's been making money and doing really well and having a lot of fun and building great products. And I'm just amazed at his progress in just a year's time. Do you find that, um, I'm curious, with the students who come in, is there a trend where they, um, you know, someone comes in with no idea or they have an idea or have like a half-baked idea? Do you find like certain people have uh, more success in the program? Like if they come in with a blank slate or they come, you know what I mean? Yeah, the people that come in with a fire in their belly, like there's something that they are really excited about and every step along the way, every lesson they learn, they're excited because they have a way to apply it mm -hmm. they're trying to build. Those are the people that ultimately like get the best outcome, no question. Yeah. That's not to say that, you know, you, you can't come to our program with, you know, no idea because we help you figure that out. Right. A lot of other people that are passionate about ideas you can contribute to, but I've definitely seen the most meteoric uh, learning occur with people that are really fired up about something. So, is there one case in particular that you that strikes you like, wow, this is a great idea, and the person came in and kind of um, executed on it because of the starter league? Well, you know, there's there's a lot of great ideas, and I think more importantly, I I'm interested in the ones that end up succeeding or the ones that come to fruition mm -hmm. a lot of them sound good but maybe they're overly complex or maybe there's mm -hmm. you know too high of a barrier or something like that so one of the other examples that I really like and we tell this story on the starter school uh, dot com stories page but Tom Brown so Tom Brown was in our first class and he was a simple guy he was a real estate agent uh, he had gotten his MBA and he was frustrated because he had to hire people to, you know, he wanted some software he wanted to build to better manage his real estate listings and his leads. And the quote that he got from developers to build it is what inspired him to sign up for our program. <laughs> and after going through our program... What was the quote? I, I'm not sure what the number was. I'm guessing it was in the twenty or $30,000 range. Okay. And basically he decided why not invest in myself, which will have ultimate return rather than a one-time investment in something that I'm not even sure will work. Right. So he ended up building his real estate listing app. It was uh, originally it was designed uh, to help people live by transit. So you could find real estate listings that were near public transit locations in Chicago, and he thought that that was something that you know people really wanted. For sure. What yeah. he learned, and this is why this lesson is so important. He would have made that investment to do live by transit and would have learned that they aren't interested in much as in transit as they are in school districts. Hmm. He ended up evolving with by transit into something called School Sparrow, which became this resource for parents to identify places they wanted to live so that they could be in the type of school they wanted their kid to be in. That into a huge uh, lead generator for him and has helped him you know, run his own business and provide for his wife and child. So that is something that I think is a wonderful story that is, you know, vastly untold, but something I think is an example of something that happens a lot going through our program. Nice. Love it. So what's been, you know, talking about some of those successes, what's been a painful moment in business for you? Because it always it hasn't been like ice cream and puppy dogs. What? Right. A, a, another painful moment because, you know, the first, you know, the snafu with that product team was challenging as well. But something very, you know, painful was early on we had – you know, more team members is just me and Mike, and you know there was another person involved that was helping us get started with the business, and we ended up not aligning as much in terms of workflow and commitment. And because of that, I had to make a really tough decision, and you know, ask this person to 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 leave, and that was so difficult because I was so inexperienced. I had um, I had never really fired someone in that way, like as the CEO of a business before and to have to go through that uh, so early on right at a critical moment right before we l launched our site right before we got everything off the ground to get everything started I had to let a key key person go 
Um, and then we had to take on and absorb all those responsibilities between the two of us. That was really difficult. So uh, that's something I think about a lot. And I think it was the right decision, ultimately. But we had to you know, pay a short-term price for it, which was you know, a lot of late nights and long hours. Yeah. So what was there a moment early on that you think back on and that you are glad you're not in that position anymore? Well, yeah. So as much as I say money doesn't matter, we damn near ran out of it right before the, the, the class started. Like my co-founder, Mike, ran like hit zero. He ran out of money uh, two months or a month and a half before the class started. And I ended up having the footing the bill for him and me. So my burn rate doubled and it was close. It was like down to the wire in terms of how much money we would have to actually have a roof over our heads and eat and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I remember that and it's definitely great to have some success where you can actually pay yourself and run a business and focus on running the business rather than worrying about, you know, what you're going to eat tomorrow or, you know, how you're going to pay the rent. So that's, that's uh, really valuable. Um, and important, and I'm glad it happened. And hopefully, with all the students that we empower, you know, they have to make a similar investment, and they all have to go through something similar to that, where they're struggling. You know, even when they go through our program, and what we hope and what we have designed in our school is a way for them to uh, provide for themselves after going through our program in ways where they can do meaningful work and find, you know, great companies to start and great businesses and good jobs. Yeah. So what's your best piece of advice for someone maybe just starting or owns a business now? What do you tell people? Yeah, so I, I have three main things that I refer to when I'm trying to distill what I've learned and how I could share that with other people and what they should think about. The three things are trust yourself, decide quickly, and don't quit. Those three things for me have meant so much. So trusting myself, I, like, you're not going to be 100% right. You know, you're, you're not always going to be right. If you try too hard to be 100% right on every decision, you're going to move too slow, you're going to think too slowly, and you're not going to be able to adapt and iterate in a way that's going to enable you to actually grow your business. So trusting yourself even when you aren't sure whether you're going to make the right call and you'll learn from it. Uh, going along with that, deciding quickly. So if you think too long about a decision, you know, it's going to stagnate and you're going to get caught in stasis. And then finally, don't quit. So along with trusting yourself and making decisions, you have to be persistent because something's going to go wrong, things are going to mess up, you're going to keep deciding quickly and something that's just not going to work and you're not going to be sure what to do. Don't just lay down and give up. You have to push through because the people that I've seen, myself included, but a lot of people I've observed, the ones that succeed aren't the ones that are always right. They're the ones that are persistent and incessantly focused on figuring it out no matter what obstacles come their way. So I would say, yeah, trust yourself, decide quickly, and don't quit. So what, that's a hard, those are hard ones. And the, um, the decide quickly, I think people kind of take long or they do research. or how did you, Was there a time when you remember where, that you think back on that is painful enough for you to decide quickly, like where you didn't decide quickly? Well, yes. So letting people go. It's always easy to say you should, you know, fire fast, hire slow. But in practice, it's much harder. Right. And it takes a lot more time depending on the situation and your needs. For instance, you know, I'll just use a hypothetical example. Uh, let's say one of our instructors, you know, we, we had a teacher and, you know, the teacher wasn't working out and we need to replace them or bring in someone else. Right. We have a commitment to our students to actually deliver this, these classes physically. You can't just switch someone out like that mid-quarter or all, you know, half the way through or, or you know, what have you. So because of that, we have to be really careful with you know, how we time things and how we structure our staff so that we have the right uh, contingency plans if something goes wrong. Yeah, that makes sense. What's, so what's the best piece of advice you've gotten from a mentor that's been most valuable? Or mentors? So the two mentors I think of are Jason Fried and Troy Hennikoff. Uh, Jason Fried's a founder and CEO of 37 Signals. Troy Hennikoff is the managing director of Techstars in Chicago. 
And these two guys have been amazing mentors to me. And they've really, like, they have different, uh, different perspectives, which is very helpful. So Troy will, you know, really ring me over the head with how to, you know, structure my, you know, finances and how to think about, you know, how the business should operate. So he taught me, you know, how to structure financial, you know, my financial model. Even though sometimes I reject some of his advice, uh, the way I typically do it is just making sure that I'm I'm earning more than we spend. But in terms of actually setting up the, you know, the income statement, managing the cash flow, understanding the balance sheet, those are very simple, essential business things. And while we may take it for granted and just assume that we kind of know, there's an art to it. There's an art to it depending on what your business is and how it works and how you actually – it influences the decisions you make, who you can hire, what classes you need to teach, and how you want to structure your offer. So that was really helpful. But on the other side, Jason Fried has really made me focus a lot more on my writing. You know, becoming a better writer, how you communicate. We write emails every day. I write copy for the website. I interact with students and what I, I say. And, and it's just such an essential component to uh, running a business. And I really didn't prioritize it as much until I interacted with Jason. So what's um, some of the advice that you haven't followed and why? Right. So alongside, you know, Troy giving me such great business and financial advice, on the other side, I've pushed back dramatically in respect to scaling. So he runs Techstars, uh, Chicago. And Techstars is by design, an accelerator that's trying to accelerate your growth. They want you to grow. They want you to become a business that could raise venture capital money, that could scale, and that could reach mass markets. And that's his mindset, which makes total sense. However, the decision that I've made as a business owner with my company is not, like I said before, to scale per se. I don't want to scale the program in terms of you know, uh, availability. I want to scale the quality of the program. So the, the challenge with that has been, you know, he's pushed for automation and for, you know, allowing this service to be available to as many people as possible. But I pushed back and said, you know, I want to know everybody's name that we teach. And I want to make sure I get to know their stories. And, you know, 1,000 versus 100 versus 10, those are very different uh, layers of ability in terms of how I can interact with these people. Yeah. So I have uh, one last question for you, Neil. But before I ask it, I just want you to tell the audience a little bit about Starter League. What's exciting now? What's going on recently? Sure. So with the Starter League, we've had some amazing uh, developments in the past. You know, I mean, we've been in business for two years, but in the past few months, we've made some big announcements. So we launched a new program called Starter School. Starterschool.com is a new address for that, and it's a nine-month program that combines. All of our current course offerings between, you know, programming, design, uh, and product development. And then on top of that, we've added entrepreneurship. So we want it to be the best place for people to make their ideas a reality through software and also learn how to start a company and build a business around your, your product after you've built it. So I'm really excited for that program because it was the original design for what we intended to do. It was just too long, too immersive, and at that time too expensive for us to, to provide. Uh, but now we can confidently confidently do it with some of the smartest people in the world uh, to help you learn how to build software. So that's great. And then we're still running our starter league classes, which are three months long, and we're building software. Uh, so we've got a lot of great partnerships and activities going on with our company too. So where can people find it? Just so you you know give the actual domain. Starterschool.com, mm -hmm. and our core site is starterleague.com. Okay. So my last question is, I, I have so many from written, jotted down here from what you're talking, but one is, um, so you have these amazing mentors. You started the company two years ago. So how do you attract, like you have relations with 37 Signals. How do you attract those high level companies? Or what did the you do? Way, yeah, the, the way that that works is you have to just be yourself, be genuine, be honest, be open with who you are, what you believe expose your ignorance but also expose how you think and in doing so I've you know amassed quite a a roster of, of support and it's not because of me personally or individually it's because of what I'm trying to do and a lot of people believe in what we're doing education and the impact that we could have to enable people 
to wield technology to do meaningful work is something that resonates with the right kind of person. And it just so happens that a lot of very successful business owners and entrepreneurs align with those interests. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do you start off like reaching out to them or do they find you just by it, what you're doing? It's a mixture. It depends on what's going on. But I will say that for the most part, those opportunities have found us. I, I am not actively seeking you know, mentorship or you know, partnerships or connections. People see the work that we do, the people that we help, and then like connections are you know kind of occur organically from those uh, from that work. Cool. All right, Neil, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I always thoroughly enjoy talking to you, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, man. It was great. All right.